Welcome back to New Books and Political Science, a podcast on the New Books Network. I'm Susan Lee Bell at St. Joseph's University, and today I'm joined by Dr. Wendy L. Rouse to discuss her new book, Public Faces, Secret Lives, A Queer History of the Women's Suffrage Movement, published by NYU Press in 2022. When the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment was commemorated in 2020, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony were often the focus of museum exhibits, teach-outs, and well-timed scholarly works. Highlighting the queerness of the movement was rarely the narrative, but Public Faces Secret Lives argues that the narrow focus on cisgender, heterosexual women erases the existence and importance of queer suffragists. Hiding queerness reinforced a, quote, patriarchal, cis-heteronormative standard of ideal womanhood and manhood in order to make suffragists and women's suffrage more palatable to voters, close quote. Yet queerness was central to the history of the suffrage movement. Dr. Wendy L. Rouse not only recovers the lives of individual queer suffragists, she queers the history of the women's suffrage movement as a whole. Her work emphasizes the complex ways in which suffragists balance their principled beliefs in wider social reforms with a strategic form of respectability politics. In order to contribute to a process of recovery, her book forcefully examines the manner in which historical processes have led to the erasure of queerness in the history of the suffrage movement and the consequences of that erasure. Dr. Wendy L. Rouse is a historian whose research focuses on the history of gender and sexuality in the progressive era. She's presently professor of history at San Jose State University, where she's the program coordinator for the History Social Science Teacher Preparation Program. I am delighted to welcome Wendy to the New Books Network. Thank you for having me here. I'm so excited. So your book, which I enjoyed so much, um, actually on a vacation, so it's a it's a serious book that can is also a page turner. You know, your book opens in 1873 with Dr. Mary Edwards Walker walking onto the stage of the National Women's Suffrage Association Convention in Washington, D.C. Um, Susan B. Anthony does not immediately yield the floor. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you say, is visibly annoyed. Um, And she doesn't believe Dr. Walker should speak because she wasn't on the program. Yet Anthony, you say, understands that Dr. Walker was famous and popular, and she yields the floor And Dr. Walker explicitly criticizes the National Women's Suffrage Association for failing to push broader social reforms. Now, Dr. Walker was famous in her time, but she's not had a place in our American narrative, uh, as Susan B. Anthony has. So let's start with why Dr. Walker was so famous. What was she famous for as she stepped onto the stage at the NWSA? Yeah, so Dr. Walker was a famous dress reformer. So she was advocating for the idea that women should be able to wear any clothing that they chose. And if you know anything about Amelia Bloomer and the the movement, uh, the Bloomers, as they're called, right, this movement for the, for women to be able to dress as they please in, in more comfortable, uh, non-restrictive clothing, um, that's how Walker had kind of gained her fame by wearing clothing that was typically associated with men at the time. And so... The early suffragists had all been advocates of dress reform, but as the years went by, they began to de-emphasize the focus on dress reform and to focus more explicitly on the fight for the vote because they felt like they were getting too much criticism for appearing in this uh, dress reform outfit. And so they kind of dropped that as a cause. So Walker was upset that they had had chosen to step away from what she perceived as a very important issue for women's rights. And um, so she was criticizing the leaders for being too narrow in their focus for the fight for women's equality. Um, Two things. One, remind people who Walker was in addition to the dress reform piece because she's Dr. Walker. And also, why was dress reform so important to her? Yeah, so Dr. Mary Edwards Walker had been a physician during the Civil War and had gained some fame for being this really well-known uh, physician, women physician, who helped in in the movement. And 
The dress reform movement itself was significant because it reflected the idea that women should have the right to be comfortable, to wear non-restrictive, to wear healthy clothing, because as you know, corsets and other clothing at the time was considered very unhealthy. Uh, and so it was part of this broader idea that um, that women shouldn't be confined and restricted to these very strict gender norms and gender ideas about presentation. So the fight for women's right to wear what they wanted to wear was part of this broader conversation about women having access to equal rights. And so that's why Dr. Mary Edwards Walker was really an advocate of this. So, uh, and we're going to talk a lot about all of the things that you just said, but why why this project for you um, now? You know, tell us a little bit about your previous scholarship and how this book, you know, builds upon it. Yeah, so in the past, I've mostly focused on the progressive era. So about 1900 to 1920, I've looked at immigration history. I've looked at um, the history of families and children and women's history specifically. My last book was on, was her own hero, The Origins of the Women's Self-Defense Movement. And I was literally looking at how women began studying boxing, jujitsu during the early 20th century as a means of physical empowerment, right? As a means of stepping outside the gendered norms and really being able to protect and defend themselves on the street and in their own lives, in their own homes from violence that they faced as, as women. And when I was researching that project, I noticed this clear association between the women's self-defense movement and the women's rights movement or the suffrage movement at the time. And this really fascinated me because I saw these connections between this idea of their physical empowerment and their political empowerment. And so that made me much more interested in the suffrage movement itself. I always taught suffrage history, you know, in, in my U.S. history classes. And another thing that I started to be curious about was the relationships of the individual suffrages. Because what I noticed is that we tend to talk about the political history, right? We talk about their fight for the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and we forget that these were real people with real lives and that their choice to be involved in this movement really impacted their personal lives, their personal relationships. Um, even in this this argument that we're talking about between Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, right? There's all kinds of personal politics that come into play. So I was curious about the lives of the suffragists and how did their involvement impact their relationships. And as I started diving into some of their individual lives, I noticed that their relationships were indeed very queer, a very gender, non-conforming, very sexual, non-conforming. I mean, there was a lot of same sex intimate relationships movement. And so that led me into wanting to know more about that aspect of the history of the suffrage movement. And one of the things I like most about the book is the way in which the suffragists emerge as individuals who are part of a wider movement. They they are all very different. You ne- you don't try to make them similar. You don't you you know you also don't try to put them at war with each other. But you really try to show the complexity and the texture of this movement in a way that I've not seen in other suffrage um, histories. So thank you. I I really enjoyed that part. Uh, you speak explicitly at the beginning of the book about language choice. You, you know, you say that you're going to use the word queer as an umbrella term, you know, to refer to suffragists who were who were not strictly heterosexual or cisgender. And I, I'd like you to explain just a little bit more about that choice and why you think it's an important choice for capturing the identity of 19th century people who might not have used that word themselves to just dis- to describe themselves. Yeah, this was an issue that really was a concern in the very beginning of my research because I was new to studying LGBTQ history or queer history, and I wasn't exactly sure what language I should be using. Um, so I, I did a lot of research and I learned a lot about queer history and as I learned, I started to understand that really our modern ideas about gender and sexuality cannot be applied to the past because they didn't live in the same time period. They weren't experiencing the same social norms that we do today. And so any of the modern terms like uh, like lesbian or bisexual or pansexual or gender non-binary or, or gender queer, that really doesn't apply when looking at the past because they didn't 
have or use those words to describe themselves. Those were not in common usage in the pre-1920 period. Even though maybe those words existed, they weren't being used by the individuals to identify themselves. There was also no common like queer community, right? There's no LGBTQ movement yet. So there's no sense of this, uh, we are united in a struggle together, uh, fighting for common cause. So with that, then, when we're talking about the past, we can't say, therefore, queer people didn't exist, right? Because queer people have always existed. But the terms that they used differed from what we use today. So queer is often seen as a broad term to identify, as you said, anyone who is non-heterosexual or non-cisgender. And I found that that was a much more encompassing term that allowed us to talk about gender nonconformity, a variety of gender expressions, a variety of gender identities and sexual identities. And it made it much more easy to kind of address this queer history of the suffrage movement without getting into the weeds of, of the modern terminology debate. And I really think it works for the reader. I mean, I I think you explain it so clearly in the opening, and then as it's threaded through, the the words work. Like they don't jar the reader out of the time period that you know you're focusing on. Um, You know, and I think like you know the the book is trying to show complexity, right? It's it's really trying to add an entire dimension that has been erased. Um, and and we've seen some excellent work on how race, for example, you know, was is is ignored, and also how it fractured the movement. You know, how leaders opted to leave out contentious issues of equality in order to satisfy, in the case of race, um, Southern suffragists. What are some of the cleavages? Obviously, you're alluding to them in the opening story about Dr. Walker walking onto the stage and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton there. What are some of the cleavages that you think your book reveals uh, within the movement? And and how do they help us better understand the movement as a, as a whole? I think the biggest kind of overarching theme is that there is a great deal of diversity within the suffrage movement. There are individuals uh, expressing a wide variety of gender identities and sexualities, races, ethnicities, right? There's a lot of diversity in the movement and it's difficult for them to identify what, what is the main issues that we should focus on? How do we gain popular support for these ideas, these broad ideas of women's rights? And what happens then is there, there's almost this, this huge, like, debate within the movement about how they publicly should present themselves. You know, anti-suffragists are claiming that these are mannish, um, abnormal women who look nothing like or act nothing like proper, respectable women should act. And so in response to this, the mainstream suffrage leaders, many of themselves who, if they were alive today, might identify as as lesbian, gay, queer, um, they are concerned about how to best present their cause in a way that's going to gain the, the most support. And so in the process, they end up really narrowing their focus to a single issue, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and then really narrowing their message to specifically present themselves as respectable wives and mothers, even though many in the movement, most I would say, were not married, were not heterosexual, were not like even interested in some of these same issues, were not white, were not middle class. Um, they started to do that as a, a conscious attempt to try to gain the popular support. This had negative consequences, which is another point that I keep making um, throughout the, the book is that many of the most marginalized members of their community, so we're talking about Black women, women of color, Indigenous women, um, we're talking about gender nonconforming individuals, we're talking about uh, queer women, like gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, all of these individuals are no longer seen as part of the movement, right? They're almost pushed to the extremes and, and marginalized or erased from public view. And so this has long-term consequences for the for queer history and also for social movements as a whole. Um, wow, that was so beautifully said. You have uh, an early example of this at the individual level in the introduction to the book. You show us a picture of Anna Shaw, and she has this super short haircut and 
you know, I mean, it's a great, it's a great photo. It's a, you know, it's the kind of photo you would want on your profile if you were doing social media. But you describe how it is she altered her own appearance in a sense, making the kind of respectability politics decision that you're describing the movement makes. She makes it internally. It's internalized for her that she, that her success or her ability to do certain things is somehow made easier if she conforms and that sort of tension within her own individual decisions. Um, and, and this is one of the sort of brilliant aspects of the book is the way in which you move between the individual lives of uh, the suffragists and the broader movement. And you, you said this at the start, you're a specialist in this period. Your The book is, is narrating one part of the story, which is the end of the 19th century to the ratification. Um, and, and as you say, there was this perception of suffragists as sexual and gender deviants who were dangerous to society. And I, I'd like you to outline just a little bit more about what that propaganda looked like in terms of depicting suffragists as dangerous and and who was that message coming from and and then we can talk about how the suffragists responded but but what was the kind of stuff that was out there sure so anti-suffragists implied that uh, that suffragists that women who wanted the vote uh, were abnormal that they were not like the average wife and mother, that their demand for equal rights reflected their essential desire to to upset the existing gender order, right? Because there was this idea of separate spheres, that men operate in the public sphere, in the political world, and that women operate in the private sphere, in the world of the home, and that each in, in balance kind of keeps society operating and functioning. And so this idea that these women wanted to enter the, the political sphere was a threat. It, it literally would undermine the stability of society, of families. Um, and it was therefore the marketing of the anti-suffrage movement was that these women were going to destroy society if they continued in, in their demand for the vote. Um, and so what they did then is anti-suffragists took these individuals in the movement, like Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who were advocating for a more extreme upheaval. I mean, they are advocating for an upheaval of the gender binary. And, and so they point to these women and they say, this is the, this is what's going to happen. Women will become men, you know, men will become women. It will literally invert the norms and we'll essentially have a complete chaos in society. So it's just, it's panic over the potential that the gender binary might be disrupted and that the balance uh, would be would destroy society. There's a sort of irony to the idea that any man who accepts the notion of women's equality becomes a passive, unmanned person. So it's like he loses he loses the power that he has by simply agreeing with this idea of of women's equality. Now there had been some success. The marriage equality acts had started to chip away at some aspects of coverture. Coverture is uh, a system of law that's been around in the English system that we inherited since at least the 12th century that says that that women, married women, are covered by their husband in law. So the couple is one person in law represented by the husband, and he has um, uh, rights that include sexual access 24-7, a certain amount of, uh, of violence that he is allowed to, to beat but not kill his wife, et cetera, and also to take wages and property that may have been inherited um, by his wife. So, so they had had some successes, but the vote seems to be the thing that really spoke to equality in a very, very different way than, than those other reforms. Um, how did the suffragists respond to this propaganda? Did, you know, you're saying that they, in fact, did realize they maybe could practice a form of respectability politics and wear certain clothes. Were there other things that they did to try to push back on that narrative? 
Yeah, I think they began to shield their private lives more discreetly, right? So Anna Howard Shaw, as you mentioned, um, Trisha Franzen has written a biography of Anna Howard Shaw. So I borrow heavily on that research uh, to kind of contextualize Shaw's life. But as a young woman, she realized that her kind of gender nonconforming appearance was perceived by anti-suffragists um, as something that was a threat. And, and so she began to encourage other women in the suffrage movement to conform outwardly, right? To present yourself in the most respectable way possible, you know, to wear modest conservative clothing, you know, and she began to kind of reframe her image in a way that she found um, helped focus on her message alone. So people weren't attacking her appearance, they were focusing on her message. And for her, this was very successful from her perspective, right? So her private life, however, she had intimate relationships with women. She lived a queer, non-conforming lives in so many ways. So many of these women lived queer, non-conforming lives. And they chose to kind of keep that more private. And again, this... I'm not going to say whether this worked or not because it was an individual choice and there were a variety of reasons why individuals might choose this. And so it, but it did have effects. I think that's the important point um, is that it did have an impact because the idea was to kind of erase anyone who was not that respectable white middle-class wife or mother. Um, And so that was a conscious decision on the part of leaders of the suffrage movement And it was a decision that had repercussions down the line. But at that time, they felt like that was the only way to get their message across about the vote. And it's extraordinary because really what they are about is women's autonomy. I mean, that's part of why they want the vote. That's part of why they want dress code reform. It's why they want so many of these reforms. And this notion of choice and choosing and making decisions is crucial to autonomy yet they recognize that the, the the structural constraints, you can have agency, but as long as you're in certain structures, that agency may not be able to be as effective in terms of your public message. But this, this idea of, as you say, we start with this public-private, it goes back to ancient, the ancient Greek world, at least, and in, in, uh, in, in, in Western philosophy, and we see them using that to, on the one hand, um, have a certain kind of public message and lead a, a different kind of private life. I mean, for me, one of the strengths of the book is how you use what we know about the private lives of individual suffragists to shine this light on the broader movement. And, and also for me to dispel really mistaken understandings of former times. So, you know, the late 19th century is often depicted as a time of conformity in which, you know, women operate within a patriarchal society that emphasizes, you know, particular domestic roles, particularly in marriage. But you show the suffragists inverting this and adapting to it in really different ways. Um, How do their stories, and, you know, if you don't mind sharing maybe one or two, demonstrate the queerness of the time, you know, that our understanding of that time period is actually not accurate? Yeah, I mean, that's the most fascinating part of this research for me was to literally dive into the lives and to, to uncover what I could about these individuals. I mean, we know what their public appearance was, but what would their private lives actually like? So I guess a good example would be Alice Dunbar Nelson. Alice was a, a, a black suffragist, a member of the, of the National, the North American Women's Suffrage Association. And she was active in the movement. She was an organizer in Pennsylvania and Delaware, traveled around and gave suffrage speeches and was advocating very publicly, not only for the right of women to vote, but specifically for issues facing the black community. She was talking about the the violence against the black community. She was talking about discrimination. She was talking about um, poor housing conditions. She was talking about a wide range of issues and raising this. So her activism, her notion of women's suffrage was much broader than just the narrow focus on the vote. But she also recognized and made a conscious decision for herself to shield her private life, right? So she presented herself as publicly as a heterosexual 
widowed woman because her husband had passed away and she used his name in her speeches. She said, I, I am Mrs. Uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar because he was a very well-known black poet, um, middle-class status, right? And it afforded her respectability because she's the wife of this relatively well-known poet. And so she used that and relied on this idea of this heterosexual respectability um, to advance the cause in many ways, to, to make her voice heard, um, to give her some respectability. But privately, when you dive into her personal life, you learn that she had a wide range of relationships with men and women. At the very time she's giving these speeches, you know, and emphasizing, I'm Mrs. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, she's having relationships with women, very intense sexual relationships with women. And if she were alive today, she might identify as pansexual, bisexual. But at the time, she kept these relationships secret and hidden because it didn't further her cause in the way that she wanted it to. And she was concerned because there was so much um, hostility against black suffragists. Um, they were often attacked as being a sexual deviance, you know, it's uh, sexual, sexually immoral. And so she felt like, you know, a part of this was protecting the image of women and suffragists. But part of it's about protecting the image of black reformers at the time and making sure that um, that her community and her and her personal life is protected and safe. Um. I, I love that part of the book, and I particularly love how, in a sense, she's taking advantage of the patriarchal assumptions about the sexuality of widows. And so as she presents herself as a widow, the assumption is, well, she, of course, women can come visit her because she's not a sexual person. She's done. Her husband is dead. And, and she's able to, in a sense, use that belief um, to make personal choices that are more autonomous and, and freer. You know, you talk a lot in the book about chosen families and um, the ways in which suffragists created really powerful networks of like-minded people. Um, and this was part, you say, of how they protected themselves. Can you say a little bit more about about chosen families um, and and how that operated, and also for the people who have just read the personal library and can talk, maybe Boston marriages come up there and um, in book clubs, but they're front and center in this in your book as well. Yeah, so many suffragists form intimate same sex relationships with other women, and they move in together and they establish lives together and they live together, and at the time this was seen this was nicknamed Boston marriage because it was a, a common phenomenon, especially in Boston and areas in the, in the Northeast where educated women after college would sometimes move in together and establish a life together. And so this idea uh, was, I want to emphasize, it was way outside the norm because the expectation was that women would get married and have children. So if a woman chooses to commit her life to another woman, that's a real challenge to the existing system. So even though this was common, it wasn't accepted. I want to I want to make sure I explain that because it was common, but not necessarily ex accepted in the mainstream. So these women were really living outside the norm of their time and chosen family then becomes very important to them. Their chosen partner, right? And then their chosen friends, those that, that they let into their inner circle that know about their relationship, um, that are their, become their friends and become their extended family. There's also individuals who are gender nonconforming, whose gender identity, um, isn't the identity they were assigned at birth. And so these individuals also find that chosen family is crucial because oftentimes they were ostracized from their birth family um, or even just their activism in the suffrage movement has ostracized them from their family. So chosen family is important for uh, cisgender women and heterosexual women in the movement as well, but even more so for these queer uh, suffragists. And I tell the story of Albert Eugene DeForest who was, uh, if he were alive today, might identify as a trans man. He very visibly transitioned in Berkeley and in this San Jose area, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area in the late 1800s. And DeForest lived with uh, other suffragists. Had He adopted one of the suffragists, uh, Alita Avery, became his adopted mother. And he looked to her for, as his family. 
And there were other suffragists who he considered family and he relied on for emotional support, for support when he was arrested for his gender identity and, and was harassed uh, for that. Um, and so they became his kind of chosen family, kind of protecting him and nurturing and supporting him. And he was very active in a variety of reform movements at the time and was able to live his life and and have this very rich and fulfilling life and career in part because he created a family that would support him. Um, the first few chapters of the book focus on American suffragists, but you get to chapter four and you pull the lens back to examine how suffragists forged queer transatlantic alliances. So in, uh, you know, in the ways that, um, an individual could find comfort in building these kinds of chosen families. You you talk more about networks that formed. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the effect those networks had on the, the personal uh, lives of the suffragists and also moving their substantive claims the women for women's rights uh, forward so both both the personal and settling their their suffrage goals making their goals successful yeah i think that this chapter really helped me understand just how important these alliances were like i knew there were connections between the british suffrage movement and the american suffrage movement but i didn't realize how personal these connections were until i really started kind of looking into this so I use a couple of stories in there to highlight this, this, these transatlantic connections. And I think the most interesting one is Alice Morgan Wright. Alice was a New York suffragist. She was a young woman who had graduated college, was beginning career as a sculptor, and had this intense interest in art, but also in, in the suffrage movement. And while she was traveling across the Atlantic um, to go study art in Paris, she met Emmeline Pankhurst who was the leader of the British suffrage movement, of the militant arm of the British suffrage movement. And Alice was so enamored by this suffrage hero, right, that she kind of begins hero worshiping her. She writes letters back to, to friends at home. I can't believe I've met, you know, Pankhurst, and she's the most wonderful woman ever. And she develops what is clearly a queer crush on Pankhurst. And Pankhurst was an was an older woman who had had much experience with with many of the young women in the movement who were uh, enamored with her. And I think she saw her as just a young mentee. You know, she was going to encourage her activism, and cur- encourage her to pursue her career in art. So Alice ends up uh, keeping in contact with Pankhurst, writing letters. She's in Paris, uh, and Pankhurst is in London. And Pankhurst is just letting her know this is what's going on in the movement. You know, how are you? How's your work? And Eventually, Alice just cannot resist traveling over to London and participating in the the mass movement that is happening of the British suffragettes in, in England. And she gets arrested holding a rock in her hand about to break a window in the famous uh, mass window breaking campaign that occurred in London. And she is arrested. She is put in prison in Holloway with hundreds of other suffragettes. And her family back home finds out about it because it's headline news in in the the American newspapers that this American girl is arrested in London with the British suffrage movement. Um, And so her parents are horrified. Her family is just they don't know what to do. They're trying to get get over to England and try to get her out of jail. But she is having the time of her life because she's not only imprisoned for the cause that she cares about the most, but she's imprisoned alongside Emmeline Pankhurst. So she spends her time in prison writing love poems to Emmeline that are published in the book. And just she creates a, a, a mini sculpture of, um, of Emmeline. And she's just having the best time ever and doesn't even want to be taken out of prison. So it ends up becoming this this debate within her family. But when she is released from prison, she does remain active in the movement. And in fact, later in her life comes back into the United States and, and helps um, fight for women's suffrage here. And later has a partner, same sex partner that she lives with for the rest of her life, who's active in the militant arm of the US suffrage movement. 
So it just shows you how important these connections were. And later in their life, in fact, in the 1920s and the 1930s, her connection with Pankhurst and with many of the other British suffragettes continues to fuel their activism and they create coalitions across the Atlantic to fight for women's rights into the 20s and 30s and beyond. So these these connections that they created were literally lifelong and they were also, they helped forge these bonds in the suffrage movement internationally. Um, the book is so good at describing the impact that space has. I mean, in the vignette you just gave, the idea that prison becomes the space in which one could uh, come to terms with uh, your commitment to activism or explore your own sexual feelings or your art, you know, making the bust of Pankhurst, for example. And you talk a lot about these spaces and how they allow suffragists to socialize, to bond, to build community, and and also the relationship between having that space and developing radical ideas. Um, and you know, you you talk a lot about public and private throughout the book, and and you know, a lot of these spaces are private spaces, but you also give examples of public sites that suffragists transform into sites of queer resistance. So I'm wondering if you'd say, uh, that wasn't really a very well-formulated question. I, I, say a little bit about the importance of space and um, how space helps develop ideas, but also these public spaces and private spaces. Yeah. So if we're living in a time of separate spheres, right? And the idea is that women's space is literally in the home and men's space is in the public sphere. This idea of women stepping out into the political sphere and literally taking their st first steps onto the street, right? Like publicly walking down the street, insisting on their right to vote is a huge upending of existing norms. And so this idea that these suffragists are marching down the street insisting that they should have equal rights is really claiming space and queering space. So to use queer as a verb, right? Because they're queer, meaning to upend existing norms, they're completely upending what is expected of women uh, at the time. A respectable white middle-class women stay inside the home and here they're stepping outside that home, demanding their right to have access to the public sphere. And then you have on top of that, uh, gender queer suffragists like Annie Tinker, who's literally marching in the parade in men's clothing, um, riding horseback and leading a cavalry of, of suffragists in the, in the New York City parade. And, and the reporters are, are just shocked by her mannish appearance and this masculine behavior. And so they're really claiming, especially queer suffragists are really claiming this space as their own. Like we have the right to exist in public. And they claim spaces, uh, they, when the National Women's Party, I talk a little bit about their um, establishment of headquarters, you know, in Washington, D.C., was a very physical claiming of space. This is our right to exist. We have the right to operate in Washington, D.C. And so there's a, a claiming of space there. And then also in, in their private spaces, these women-centered spaces become opportunities for them to develop much more intimate relationships with each other and open up a variety of queer possibilities in their romantic and personal lives. So for the first time, you have women who are graduating college, which is a homosocial sphere, right? They're predominantly going to, to university with other women. And then they're, instead of conforming and going into a, a, a heterosexual relationship, many of them are choosing to continue their lives in this homosocial space in the suffrage movement. And so in the process, they are living with other women, rooming with other women as they travel. And literally their whole lives then is about women. And this offers an opportunity for them to develop intimate relationships and romances to fall in love. And so there's lots of examples in the book of women falling in love within the private space, space of the suffrage movement. Uh, for me, one of the most poignant chapters was about queering traditions of death rituals and grieving. Um, you know, you you talk about quote the public mourning and commemoration practices took on especially significant meanings for suffragists who lived non-normative lives unquote. And I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit about 
how suffragists managed to memorialize and grieve their queer relationships, you know, and why you think these practices affect how we remember queerness, not just the queer individuals. Yeah, I ended up writing a whole chapter on death and death ritual, in part because when I was trying to uncover their personal lives, I found a lot of the evidence of their queer relationships literally at their death. So I ended up looking at probate records to see, you know, who did they leave their, all of their life belongings, their possession, who did they leave that to? And what I discovered is that oftentimes it was these intimate relationships that they had struggled so much throughout their life to maybe hide or to conceal from public view because of their professional lives, suddenly these were very clear at the moment of their death. Um, So that's how I ended up writing about death. And what I find is that they really do queer death ritual as well. They, They upend what's expected. So what you normally would see with heterosexual couples, you're seeing with these same sex relationships, right? That you're seeing that they are taking these rituals that we typically associate between a husband and a wife, and, and they are modifying those and adapting those to their queer lives. So the best example of this is I tell the story of two California suffragists, a Gail Laughlin and Dr. Mary Sperry. And Laughlin and Sperry were active in the California suffrage campaign, and they met because of their involvement in that campaign. Um, Dr. Mary Sperry's mother was the president of the California Women's Suffrage Association, and Gail Laughlin was hired to come from the national headquarters to organize the movement in California. And so that's how they met. And they fell in love. And they they lived together within the Sperry family home in San Francisco. And then they also left and lived for, for eight years in Denver together, where they lived and, and had careers and kind of developed their relationship. And it wasn't until Dr. Mary Sperry passed away in the influenza epidemic of 1919 that that the real kind of nature of their relationship comes to the fore. And how that happened is when when Sperry passed away, she asked in her will that everything be given to Laughlin and that even her physical remains be cared for by Laughlin. But the Sperry family was livid. They did not want Laughlin to be the one that cared for their daughter's remains and that, that... inherited her property. So they took her to court. They challenged it. The courts, the case went all the way through the court system. And essentially the court sided with the will that it should stand. It was Dr. Mary Sperry's wishes. And so the suffer- the, the Sperry family was so upset that they essentially created on the family tombstone, on the family headstone in, in uh, Stockton, they inscribed Sperry's name and said in memoriam, because her remains were not there. Um, But her remains were passed on to Laughlin, who cared for them for the rest of her life. And Laughlin was upset because her own reputation was attacked in this court case. The Sperry family said that that she was domineering, that she was masculine, right, implying sexual deviancy. And Mother Sperry even said they lived together and, and they slept together in the same bed, right, implying the sexual deviancy. So Laughlin decided that she was going to just carry on and she carried her partner's ashes with her for the rest of her life and cared for those until she passed away something like 30 years later. And when she passed away, she insisted in her will that they be buried side by side, laid to rest under the same headstone that bared both of their names. So ultimately in their death, uh, they were together as they were in life, but it was a very visible reminder of this power of these queer relationships and the enduring nature of them even beyond this life. Uh, It's a great story. I mean, the book is full of great stories. That particular chapter was a favorite of mine. You know, the book focuses on individuals, but really your wider point is that queerness has been erased from the history of the suffrage movement, which seems ridiculous because as you read the book, you're just, it's everywhere. It's threaded through. This is not two stories. It's multiple stories and, and, and at all different levels. What are some of the ways in which queerness has been erased and, and how has history as a discipline been part of that centering or decentering of queerness? Um, And what methods do you use to reverse that erasure? And do you think authors who are pursuing any kind of history 
need to be aware of? Yeah, so as time goes by and as the suffragists begin to age, they get older and they're concerned about their legacy. They're concerned specifically about how history will remember them, what stories will be told about them after their death. Um, this is happening. This is coinciding with the, the 1940s, the 1950s, the 1960s, right? There's an intense amount of homophobia during that time period. So many of the suffragists choose themselves to destroy evidence of their queer lives. You literally have suffragists talking about destroying their letters. So Alice Morgan Wright's partner, you know, goes through and removes all the letters that exist between her and, and uh, right. And so you have examples, and I have several examples in the book of the decision, the conscious decision of suffragists to kind of straight wash their lives, or at least erase the queerness from their lives. If they did not do that themselves, then oftentimes their biographers have done that. Because again, they're writing these biographies of these great suffragists in a homophobic time. And so the concern is that we, oh, no, there's evidence of their queer lives. We can't talk about that. So oftentimes they just do not mention it. So you get this kind of stereotypical old spinster woman who never married, you know, and no mention that she lived with another woman for 40 years, right? So it's kind of this erasure, again, of another form. And then you have descendants also who erase the queer history of suffragists. So I talk about how like Gail Laughlin's biographer was a family member and clearly knew about Laughlin's death and that she's buried with Mary Sperry um, and chose not to talk about that, just chose not to ad address at all this long history in this court case or anything about them having a life together. So sometimes it's the suffragists, sometimes it's their biographers, sometimes it's the descendants that erase it. And so then the, 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 the difficult part for the historian is to try to uncover these lives that were consciously erased throughout time and to try to figure out what was their life actually like, who were their partners, who was most important to them, and how did this shape their involvement in the suffrage movement? And so it's literally sometimes going through the scraps. In Alice Morgan Wright's uh, collection, it was sometimes going through the back of her address books, which you wouldn't think to look, right? And then there's scribbled notes to her partner in there that I don't know if she was writing drafts of letters or what, but I would find evidence of that. Or going through and looking in her old notebooks from college, which you wouldn't think would have any reflection on her later career in life. And yet there are these queer love poems to other women where she's just imagining this future of, of living with these women. And so it really kind of alludes the whole, illustrates her whole life and gives you an idea of exactly how queer uh, many of these suffragists were throughout their their whole lives. Um, well, it's a fabulous book. I enjoyed uh, every page. Um, is there something that we haven't talked about that uh, that you would like to include in this discussion? I think just making sure that we emphasize how important these stories really are. Um, queer history gets erased. Women's history often gets erased. And it's important to recognize that these stories are part of the larger story, right? These are our histories and that we must talk about history. And, you know, there's a lot of efforts right now. There's the don't say gay laws. There's a lot of attempts to try to hide and bury uh, gay history once again. So this isn't something that happened in the past. It's something that's ongoing, this continued attempt to erase various aspects of our history. So I think it's important to continue to to fight for our right to know our history and to make sure that we are are telling these stories that are so important to, to all of our pasts. What is your uh, current project focusing on? I'm going to continue to look at queer history. Um, I'm looking at World War II potentially right now and some different aspects of queer lives because some stories have come forward. Uh, through the process of doing this, I've learned a little bit more uh, about uh, efforts to hide queer history in different time periods as well. So I might, I might be working on something like that, but it's still up in the air. Is that going to be hard? You know, you're, you've, you, you're a master of the progressive era, and that is uh, quite clear on every page of this book. You're, you're, you're bringing so much other background to, to move that far forward to into the 20th century. Yes, we'll see. Um, that That's part of my trepidation, I guess, moving forward. But at the same time, there's stories that are coming to light that they, they need to be told. Well, uh, Wendy, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us on New Books in 
political science and history. Uh, the book is Public Faces, Secret Lives, uh, A Queer History of the Women's Suffrage Movement, published by NYU Press in 2020. Thanks so much for joining me, Wendy. Thank you.